Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight over the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave look man this is my first and last situation with the police i was 22 years old and I was transferring from one bus to another on the way home. And there was a large group of young brothers hanging out on the bus stop. All of a sudden, two police officers grabbed me, handcuffed my hands behind my back, threw me to the ground with so much force, I busted my head. I told them I was not a part of that group and definitely not selling drugs. They frisked me and then they let me go since I didn't have any drugs. They never said a word until they handcuffed me and threw me to the ground. This was the 80s and today, would be called racial profiling. Yeah, I had a situation with the police also. I was in my studio recording with some artists and it was a late night session. We decided to go to the store and get some refreshments. So we all piled in my car, about five of us. It was two, three, four o'clock in the morning. I'm not sh sure, I don't remember the time. I remember going to the store and we got about four or five blocks from my house on our way back. And so I was wondering why was, what was the big, um, what was the big deal? Why were we being searched? And I kind of felt like our rights were violated. Um, so when I asked, one of the officers said, well, we seen the guy in the front seat hand the guy in the back seat something and we thought you were handing a weapon, passing a weapon. So in all actuality, what happened was the guy in the back seat asked for a cigarette and the guy in the front passenger seat gave him a cigarette. So I think the moral of the story is, um, where do they get these perceptions of people? Um, if we were in a, a bunch of white kids in the car in the middle of the night in a predominantly white neighborhood, would they have the perception that we were passing a weapon back and forth? Or um, is that just because of where we were? Where, is that just because of where we were and who we were? My name is Nakima Levy Pounds, and I'm a law professor at the University of St. Thomas, and also the director of the Community Justice Project, which is a civil rights legal clinic. Well, when I think about the word peer, I tend to think of people who have been in a similar circumstance um, as another perhaps comparative group. So if we're thinking, for example, a jury of one's peers. Um, essentially, I would think of peers as, as people who have some type of nexus to the life experiences of the other person involved or people involved. One of the issues that impacts our society most today is what I would call the incarceration crisis. And when I say incarceration crisis, I'm talking about the fact that more than 2.4 million people are currently incarcerated in this country. So while the United States holds 5% of the world's population, we hold 25% of the world's prisoners. And unfortunately, uh, our, the exploding prison population here in the United States um, falls most heavily on the African-American community. African-Americans are roughly 
of the population here in the United States, but we're roughly 40% of those who are incarcerated here. And when you have a huge percentage of people being incarcerated from a particular racial and ethnic group, that impacts the family and it impacts the entire community. One of the other issues that um, occurs, I would say as sort of a parallel to our um, exploding prison population is the war on drugs. So when I'm thinking about the prison population, one might ask the question of, well, how did we get to this point? How did we get to a place where we hold the highest number of, uh, of prisoners in the world? Well, if you look back historically, one of the things that happened was that um, in the mid 1980s, Congress decided to get tough on crime. And when they spoke about getting tough on crime, what they did at that time was to launch what we know of as the war on drugs. And through the war on drugs, um, their initial purpose was to ensure that high level drug dealers or drug kingpins would be sentenced to lengthy prison terms. One of the key things that's talked about is the disparity between crack and powder cocaine called the um, 100 to one um, sentencing disparity. So one of the, um, things that happened as a result of the war on drugs was that if a person was caught with uh, five grams of crack cocaine, which is roughly the size of a teaspoon, versus a loaf of bread size um, of powder cocaine or 500 grams, that would lead to the same five-year mandatory minimum prison term. And the other aspect um, of the law that was a little difficult to reconcile um, was is the fact that without powder cocaine, you can't make crack cocaine. So one of the things that I've always argued is the fact that we need to actually address the base, you know, the substance, you know, of, of crack cocaine and, and treat that differently. Um, because again, without powder, you, you won't have crack. So why treat them both the same if one is the actual cause of the other? But one of the things that challenges me most as a lawyer and as a mom um, is looking at the racial disparities that exist in Minnesota. I argue that there are two Minnesotas, one black, one white, both separate and unequal. And that's a real um, challenge, you know, to see some of the patterns of racial disparities occurring here and to feel as though more needs to be done sooner rather than later to address those disparities. I'm the defense attorney in this case, and I'll be cross-examining a potential jurist. Sir, if you were a defendant in this case, would you want someone with your frame of mind sitting in judgment of you? Based on what's been said previously and knowing my makeup, perhaps not. I think I could be an arch-conservative and, you know, I'm influenced by, by my background in business and whatever, and perhaps not. And specifically, what is it in your background that makes you feel that you wouldn't be f maybe as fair as other jurors possibly could be? Well, I like to think that I'm not unfair, but I think everybody is a product of their environment. I have, again, I'm, I'm quite conservative. I appreciate that. Would, I would much rather have an honest answer now than after it's all done and find out. When all is said and done, do you feel that you could be as a fair a juror as anyone else because of your background in business and your personal feelings that would make you unfair to a defendant, specifically this defendant? Honestly, as you can be, searching for an honest answer? I'd like to think that I'm fair, but again, I'm a product of my environment. And you ask the question of somebody else about the police officers, my answer on that would be, I would place my credence on what they would say than other people. I think in most cases they would be disinterested. It's a job. That's my opinion. I think I would be fair, but again, I have, I have opinions in those areas, and I have to say it directly. I'm. I'm not totally sure of how I would react to one of the defendants who's black. I've had two or three very traumatic experiences in my life, and there were blacks on the other end of it. Do you feel, and I realize this is hard, 
but you do feel that in this case, because one of the defendants is black, that you would have a hard time being a fair juror in regards to him despite your best efforts? I would have more difficulty than, I would have some. I, I'll have some difficulty with that. Is there anything else in your background or in your views toward life or the world that you feel might make it hard for you to be fair to either defendants? No. Part of the trial process that you're experiencing now is, as the judge said, called the voir dire, the time when the attorneys and potential jurors can interact. In fact, all of us have something in common. We're hot, we're tired, and we want to go home. What I would ask you to do is just answer my questions with candor. What I'm trying to do is determine whether or not some of you have potential problems with being a juror in this particular case. Now, good day, sir. Thank you very much for being uh, here this morning. Good morning. With, do you have any problems with the idea that the state has a responsibility to prove someone guilty? I guess not really. I question the whole concept, but I certainly would follow the instruction if that's the case. I would find the defendant guilty or not guilty based on what the state... I, I would guess no in one word. I have no problems with that. Well, we talked about this yesterday. If you and, and I, and again, this is a discussion about how things could be, went out on the lawn here and we were discussing something, we would make the discussion and our decision based on our own rules. If you're on the jury, the judge gives you the rules, those being his instructions, and you would have no problem following those, would you? No problem. Okay. What we're talking is a difference in decision-making tools. Yeah. Okay. Yesterday we were talking, I think you talked with Mr. Long, the other defense attorney at length about the fact that Mr. Hollins being black might affect you. Do you still feel that that may have an effect on your being on this jury? I have to say honestly that it might. In what way do you think it would have an effect? Do you think that you would have a harder time believing what he said? No, no, I don't think that's the problem. Do you think the fact that he's charged, he's been charged with a crime, that that affects you right now? Uh-huh. Do you tend to believe he would be more guilty than not guilty right now? Based on the, you know, a few experiences that I've had, it could creep into my decision-making process. That's right. Are the experiences you've had, you're relying on, are things that have happened to you personally? Uh-huh. But Mr. Hollins has nothing to do with these. No. But based on upon what we've talked about so far and the things you've heard in the last couple days and what we've talked about right now, do you think that you could be fair to Mr. Hollins and Mr. Brown? I have to answer the same way I did yesterday. I have a question in my mind about that. Okay. I'm not saying that it's a blatant thing, but I'm questioning myself. The question you have is you have a little uncertainty whether or not you could completely put out of your, your biases or prejudices out of your from your mind? Uh-huh. And just going back, just to cover this area about the biases and prejudices, just the fact that you had a bad experience with a black person in the past, that wouldn't sway you if you're on this jury, will it? We're back to the same question. It might. But you've had bad experiences, I take it, with white people, have you not? Yes, I don't know whether you're searching for something for me. No. As I said, the two worst experiences I've had in my life involved racial situations. But you can see situations where black people and yourself could have no problems? Absolutely. I'm sure on your job you deal with black people regularly. No, I don't, not at all. But the fact that you don't deal with them doesn't bother you. You can deal with a black person. I've had a few dealings with them. Would you feel comfortable dealing on an everyday basis with a black person? I would have no problem with it, I wouldn't think. Well, you know now, you feel you could at least try to be fair to Mr. Hollins? Well, certainly I would try to be fair. Thank you very much for your candor. 
pass this panel for cause. Thank you, attorney. Well, ladies and gentlemen of group two, we've passed the first big hurdle with respect of, to the jurors in this litigation. These three attorneys tell me they have passed this panel for cause. What that means is they find no cause to challenge you under the law of this state with respect to your qualifications to serve as jurors in this case.